Have you ever wondered what makes bodies tick? Are you creating this sexual reality you desire and require? Would you like to know more about what else is possible with bodies? What if your fantasies are not as strange as you thought they were? What if you could learn to be kinder to your body and kinder to others' bodies? Would you like to create confidence in the bedroom and beyond? How has your sex life, or lack of it, affected other areas of your life? Have you lost your mojo and wondered where to find it? Everyone has the potency to be a sexual superhero. Get ready to listen, sense, and play with the sexualness that is you. Now, here is the host of The Pleasure Zone, Body Whisperer, Melitza Yelenich. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Pleasure Zone. I'm your host, Melitza Yelenich. I just have to say, we are like about to be hit by one of the most wicked storms we've had this year. We've actually had no snow um, in my area of Canada this year yet. And we are about to be uh, totally, totally uh, slathered in it. So it's it's interesting um, as I'm, and this is all happening tonight, and I'm choosing to get married tomorrow. So how does it get any better than that? And it was funny because a lot of what um, my lover and I were kind of like talking about, we were saying, yeah, we just like a really private ceremony, you know, if people want to come and Zoom and like join us on um, you know, zooming in, like live streaming that, yeah, we could do that too. That's fine. And so we were having a, like a really, uh, kind of like a giggle about the fact that it's becoming the private ceremony we originally chose. <laughs> so, so love you guys that wanted to show up and hey, I don't know which one of us is the major league potent, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass that over for Mike for now because he was really like really asking for a small wedding and that's what we're going to be getting. So we don't even know if our uh, the wedding officiant is going to be showing up. So how's it get better than that? So yeah, and uh, the dress I ordered didn't arrive. So um borrowing one and I got lots of fun things going on. So the whole thing actually got me thinking about there's been so many things that have just like come out of as uh, like an intriguing interesting thing so I am uh, I've been wondering about rites and rituals in general um, you know marriage being a pretty gigantic rite of passage uh, for western society and other things that are rites of passages so Tonight, we're going to be talking about sexual rites and rituals from around the world. Um, and also, uh, just to kind of give like some general ideas of what rites and rituals are, because, you know, sometimes our families have created like rites of passage that aren't really attached to any kind of um, community or religion or uh, culture or anything. And they're just like... Well, son, you get to open the beer bottles this year, and that means you're growing up. And so, like every family's got something funny, uh, I'm sure. And it's just sometimes not spoken. And, and a lot of times what we have with these rites and rituals is they've become so incredibly significant that if they aren't performed perfectly, people can get really bent out of shape about them. So... Before we go too far, I'd really like to introduce myself to you guys. If you're brand new to this show, if you're just listening in for the first time, again, my name is Melitza Yelenich, and I am. Uh, I work with a lot of different things, and one of the modalities I work with is something called Access Bars, um, and it's about working with uh, 32 different points on the head, I gently touch, and then things change. Your life could literally change. And at the very worst, you would feel like you had a really great massage. And for me, uh, it wouldn't be such a great massage as it would be have feeling like I had a really great body work. Um, my body loves body work, especially somatic body work. So um, because of that, I choose to also be a body worker. So I work on bodies, uh, lining spines through gentle movement. And one of the other most fun things I get to do um, is I also do tarot readings, psychic readings for people. And I have coming up in starting in January, once a month, I have a call called Busting Open Your Psychic Self. And you can check that out on busting bustopenyourpsychicself.weebly.com. And you will find um, all kinds of choices that I'm offering for classes in the upcoming year for busting open and expanding your psychic self. 
Side note, I also love, love, love promoting other people, especially people I adore. And one of the people I super adore um, is Christine McIver, who is a producer of mine and she, and also a really great friend of mine. And she's got a really great um, creation that she has coming out starting January 14th. And that is called, and I keep giving it a new name, but it's also, it's called Choosing Big. So Choosing B-I-G, and it's a series of three calls where you will literally like, will start to expand your life uh, in all different areas, you know, that you were playing small in. You get to start playing big in. So bodaciously inviting greatness into your life. Um, and I... Um, I'm actually really excited to promote this and to the point where I, I've had ideas and I'm like getting semi sidetracked from my wedding stuff and bodacious invitation to greatness. And But I'm going to be the bodacious invi inviting you to greatness. That's what I'm going to be. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, there, there's been like, you know, ideas popping for like images have got like all this stuff going on. So there's a lot of energy on this one and it's 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 uh like creating itself. So if you are interested in um that and I am promoting a bunch of other stuff coming up in the new year, I would love to introduce you guys to any of that. So if you would like to go on um and check out the the um choosing big class it's on facebook there is a group called big living now and the now is uh, all capitals so you can join that if you like we'd love to have you in there so now now we're going to talk about the crazy awesome fun stuff that i love talking about you know sex that's what we're going to talk about crazy sex from around the world because you know I actually can't believe I haven't really talked about crazy sex from around the world. We're like 80 or something episodes in, 90 maybe episodes into um, the pleasure zone, and I haven't talked about crazy sex rituals around the world. It's hard to freaking believe. So bef uh, before I talk about that directly, um, a lot of you may be aware that there are, you know, rites and rituals around the world. And if you're really young and you're listening to this show and this is all very new to you and you're wondering what is a rite of passage or if you are older and you never really like you've heard people say it and you don't really know what it means, a rite of passage is actually a ceremony that marks a transition from one phase of life to another. So, for example, marriage is a rite of passage. So, um, me going, getting married tomorrow is a rite of passage, although it's often used to describe tumultuous transitions from adolescent to adulthood. It does refer to any of life's transitions like births and beginnings, initiations, partnerings, endings, or death, although usually um, people are like, talk about a rite of passage and there's a lot of trauma involved. Uh, I remember being in a class, it was a sociology class in high school. It was kind of what intrigued me into actually studying these things like um, you know, soci sociology, anthropology, psychology. And in that class, um, there was a girl in my class who randomly brought up this really weird, like, factoid from her family was that her brother at the age of 12 ended up getting circumcised. And, like, everybody in our class was horrified. Like, we we're like, oh my God. And she's like, no, no, no. Like, where she came from, that was really, um, it, it was like sacred, right? And that was like something that all guys at the age of 12, if if they hadn't been circumcised already, although they were supposed to wait to the age of 12, would be circumcised at that time. So pretty intense. I also know somebody that did get circumcised accidentally because he had an accident, a sex accident, and he ended up requiring getting circumcised. So those were two very different situations but I uh, just saying that can happen you can have sex accidents that do lead to circumcision wow so um, yeah tears of pain tears of laughter lord knows people are laughing and tearing up in the in the chat room so <laughs> thanks for that um so the difference so like in the title, I was talking about rites and rituals. So the rituals is a little different. A ritual is a sequence of activities involving gestures, words, objects performed in a sequence or a place, performed in accordance, uh, set sequence. So you can have rituals that are involved in rites of passage, and it's not always the case, but 
it can definitely show up that way. So I'm, I started to go, wow, well, you know, this whole thing with marriage, like, you know, when did it start? And I think I'm going to just another episode on, on the rite of passage of marriage because it is interest to me. And it's so, it's such an interesting thing around the world, um, how that works for other cultures and other people and like what, um, you know, what it is that people choose marriage for. So that's so curious to me too. So um, what I, what I did look up, which and I looked up in so many different variations on Google. I was looking up like strange sex acts, you know, I was looking up um, stuff like teen. Um, and I wonder if anybody's like checking my search engines and going, that woman's insane. We need to lock her up. The thing she searches is sick and demented. So one of the things I was looking up was like uh, preteen sex play, because I remember in that sociology class, that I had um, I'd been learning about this um, this tribe, and, and so I thought I remembered the tribe name, so I looked it up, and according to everything on Google, uh, the tribe name that I'd remembered in sociology class wasn't accurate to what I remembered the information being about. So whatever this tribe was that I remembered uh, learning about, which is really what got me curious about sex studies to begin with, uh, was a tribe in Africa where the the kids, um, like as young as six or eight years old, would, instead of, say, playing with toys, they would play with each other's body parts. And one of the little girls that was being interviewed, and I think this was actually in a National Geographic, um, that the study came from a National Geographic, so I'd have to look that up. But it was... It was something that was like uh, promoted. It was promoted in the vision for the kids who weren't choosing it. They were almost like outcast. And so this little girl was getting very bored with like having little boys stroke her clitoris. And she was like, oh, this is not fun anymore. I want to go try something else. I'd rather go run through the forest. Her reaction to it wasn't like one of like, this is violent and they're hurting me. She was like, oh, this is boring. They're not very good at it. This isn't very fun. And she was maybe like, I don't know, eight or 10 or something. So it's like body probably wasn't really feeling it, especially if she's having that much stimulation all the time. Like, like I've said on the show before, I remember, um, you know, self-stimulating at the age of four. I wasn't doing it every single day. It was like something that would strike me randomly. And I would be like, whoa, like really intense energy coming at me. And I was like, whoa, now. So um, definitely something I was picking up from other people. So some of these rites and rituals, um, you know, are are things that in our maybe society, if we found two children doing that, say a teenage boy at the age of, say, 14 or 15, and a girl at the age of 10, we would say, well, that is sexual abuse, and that's violation, and that's not okay. And so we put a lot of um, right and wrong on stuff where other cultures have it as, like, if you aren't doing this, there's something wrong with you. So a lot of these rites and rituals to me, really, as I started to look at them, have so many points. Of, I mean, you didn't have to look very far to get that there are so many points of view attached to them and so much um, stuff that comes up. Like a lot of judgment will come up like, oh, my God, I can't believe they let their children do that. Oh, my God, I can't believe that they would, you know, say that that's OK. Like there's so many things that will come up in our in our worlds around that. Like, I can't believe that little girl didn't want more of that. I can't believe that little boy didn't enjoy that. Like, there's so much stuff that we will judge the crap out of because it's so it's so not part of our culture, society. So some of the ones I will be telling you about when we come back from break uh, are doozies, and we might have some energy to clear on them because they might bring up a lot of crap in your world. Um, even I was like, wow, well, that's interesting. And there's one in particular, I, went, hmm, I wonder if I can get to that island because <laughs> boy, oh boy, that sounds, uh, sounds like a fun time for girls on that island. I'm going to check that out. So, so, um, there are, if you do Google search it, you'll find that there are, there are about 10, 15 that are typical ones that are repeated, repeated, repeated over and over again. Um, and I'm also curious about more obscure ones. So if you're aware of any of really obscure ones and you'd like to call in and talk about it, I'd love to hear about it. So when we come back from break, I'm going to reveal some of the top strangest sex things that I found on the Internet. 
Many of us have created a lot of limitations around sex and what we are willing to choose. Would you be willing to explore what has already been introduced as sexual practices on this planet? What else is possible beyond what we have already seen, heard, or thought of? What if now is the time for a totally different sexual revolution? Taking the taboo out of all aspects of sex, sexuality, and copulation. By tuning into The Pleasure Zone radio show with body whisperer Melitza Yelenich, you'll receive tools, inspiration, and a foundation to allow yourself to receive more in your sex life and quite possibly other areas of your life as well. Listen for The Pleasure Zone with Melitza every Monday at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 7 p.m. Central Time, 6 p.m. Mountain Time, and 5 p.m. Pacific Time on A2Zen.fm. What would you say if I told you that you could change your life in only one hour and all while lying down relaxing? Thousands of people all over the world have. What am I talking about? It's called Access Consciousness The Bars. The Bars is an energetic body process that contains 32 different points on your head that when run assist you in releasing decisions about any area of your life that you have made solid and as a result cannot change. The Bars is the first class in Access Consciousness a dynamic set of tools and information designed to transform any area of your life. When you have a bar session, the worst that can happen is you feel like you had a fantastic massage. The best thing that can happen is your whole life could change. Go to accessconsciousness.com today to find a facilitator to schedule a private session or to find a bars class in your area. Are you willing to give yourself an hour to change your life? This is The Pleasure Zone with body whisperer Melitza Yelenich. To participate in the program today, please call us in the U.S. Call 815-880-8255-TALK or Canada 613-800-8736. Or you can Skype us at A2Zen.fm. You can also make the choice to ask for comment by email by sending to Melitza at MelitzaYelenich.com. Now, back to the program. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to The Pleasure Zone. I'm your host, Amelia Sayalanich. And just before I was going to break, we were talking about what rites and rituals are. And on this show today, we're going to be talking about sex rites and rituals from around the world. So I did some Google searching, and I do have some websites. Um, really brief, and there's actually some YouTube videos out there as well that are fairly short, and they have about top five on them. Um, one of them I thought was particularly fun, and it relates to a lot of... Um, Actually, men um, that I've ever met have all named their penises. Men have, except for my current lover, does not have a name for his penis. But I'd have to say that literally just about every other one that I've person I've been with um, in a relationship with has had some kind of nickname for their penis. And the the very first thing that I found was that in pre what they're calling pre-contact Hawaiian culture, so that was like before a white man arrived. Everyone had public names for their genitals. So it was a different name for their genitals than it was for them. Hawaiian royalty and commoners each had their own genital chants, which described their sex organs both figuratively and literally, called melemais. The genital chants were a celebration of the future generations, boys and girls with sire. Plus, naming your genitals sounds a lot better than the, you know, the JJ or, you know, the big guy down there. So number two that I found was the Sambian tribe of New Guinea, where young men are kept away from young women for actually at least 10 years. Um, so I found a different sets of research on these guys and some of them very detailed information. So the Sambian tribe in particular, I think it's around the age of 10 or uh, something like fairly young. I'm going to see if I have information right here where it's more um, more concise. I don't know that I have that. So um, the Sambian tribes... They say that to become a man in this primitive tribe, boys are removed from the presence of all females at the age of seven. Okay, that's where it's accurate. Living with other males for 10 years. And during the 10 years, the skin is pierced, like everywhere, to remove any contamination brought upon by women. 
For the same reason, they also regularly incur nose bleeding and vomiting caused by consuming large amounts of sugar cane, which makes them really, really ill, actually. So to top it off, they're also required to ingest the semen of their elders, which is thought to sustain growth and strength. But when they are finally introduced back into the tribe, they continue to engage in nose bleeding at the same time as their wives' menstrual cycles. So that's from uh, odd.com. That's O-D-D-E-E.com. And there they have links to other um, research papers that, you know, kind of like go into that. So I just want to start off with that particular one might bring up a lot of view around young um, young people uh, engaging in sex acts with adults. And now my daughter feels like she needs to come in and be part of the show. Yes. Okay. So, you know, we have a house full of men tonight, and she'd prefer to be with mommy talking about young men drinking semen in Papua New Guinea. <laughs> there you go. How's it get any better than that? So, um, you know, if you have, like, a lot of points of view about what that is, what that means, what, um, you know, how that affects them, how about if we just destroy and uncreate all that? Times a godzillion. Right, wrong, good, bad, pock, pot, all nine shorts, boys, and beyond. I know that's like a really, that one particularly got me. For one, I was like, I had a few questions on that, and I wasn't really sure how to find the information on it. I was like, okay, so do they do they perform fellatio to get the semen, or do they do, you know, do they do hand stimulation, and then the semen goes into a, some kind of container, and then they drink it like a concoction or cocktail? I want to know these things, because I have a very, I have such a bizarre point of view about this. It's like, if I actually give fellatio, and the semen like lands in my mouth, that's joyful. But if I were to drink it from a cup, it somehow makes me go, Bleh. I'm not sure what that is. But I don't know. I don't know what that is, but it, there's something weird there for me. So whatever that is, whatever the heck that energy is, where somehow one way is cool and one way is not cool, should we just, whatever that shit's bringing up, let's just try and uncreate all that. I think God's silly and right, wrong, good, bad, pot, pot, all that, and sure, it's pleasant beyond little boys not so much but anyway so this uh thing is actually not that uncommon and i know i've brought this one up um before on the show uh from ancient greece and and I, this is one that's fairly common so i know that you guys are probably aware of the story of the uh, homosexuality in ancient greece um but it wasn't really significant right so it was just like well this is just what people do it was mostly that it was about young boys and older men was more like that was okay. The real stigma was when the two men of the same age and social class were getting it on because being the bottom was thought to be feminizing and sex was better off between people who already had a skewed power dynamic, according to the Greeks. So they were not looking at people being of the same social class or age because that would not have a submissive. So um, that was very fun for the ancient Greeks. There, it was also very typical that there was semen swallowing then as well uh, for young boys. It would make them stronger. I have that in some other information somewhere. Um, <laughs> so the other, so here's more fun information because I got lots of fun information tonight. Another fun one is uh, there's a tribe in Papua New Guinea uh, who very much reminded me uh, of the tribe that I had read about that I thought was in Africa, um, which was the Kung tribe. They actually have like a click at the sound of their name, and I can't pull off the click because I just don't have skills like that yet. So I'll keep on practicing my clicking sound. Um, so it's like an apostrophe K-U-N-G. Um, that's where I thought the information came from. But then when I did look into it further, it was something else. So this tribe is called the Trobriander Tro tribe of Papua New Guinea. And those children start engaging in sexual activity at the age of six to Fascinating, is it not? So these children um, 
the women actually are just as active as men in pursuing, in pursuing sexual encounters. Uh, they will do dances and they'll do all kinds of things to actually entice the, their partners, um, like their sex partners, into coming and playing with them. They also have one of the things they do provide for their daughters, which is kind of an interesting, nice thing that they offer, um, is that they have, I think, I believe it was this uh, this group, that they actually have huts where it's it's considered um, that the girls are supposed to like open their hut up to the boys and allow the boys to come in and, and join them um, by their choice. Like they get to choose the boys and they have their little sex huts. Um, that funny thing about this tribe now that's like oh, okay well that's just a little bit really like that's preteen okay that's interesting girls are like between the ages of six and eight boys are usually between 10 and 12 for that tribe what's funny is while they're allowed to totally go topless of course you know get it on anybody they like it is extremely prohibited to have premarital meal sharing that is so like super against their rules. However, get naked and stick a cock in your mouth, go. Get naked and stick, you know, a chicken in your mouth. That is so against the rules. Crazy people. So that's, you know, just don't do that. Don't eat together. That's just naughty. So, yeah. Huh, this just shows just going to bring up all kinds of stuff in everybody's universe, isn't it? <laughs> so at the very end, I'm just going to go, wow, everything this show was, let's everything they brought up in this show and everything that blah, blah, blah. So, so next, on to the next interesting factoid. Some believe that in ancient Egypt, it was thought the ebb and flow of the Nile was caused by the creation of God Atum's ejaculation. Because this pharaoh ritually masturbated into this famous river, and there there is actually carving paintings, um, hieroglyphs of this this particular pharaoh um, enjoying masturbating publicly. And it was I, I did some more research on it wasn't just him; it was actually Egyptian pharaohs in general had a thing about public masturbation, and I just was like, wow, so. This is according to, uh, I believe, an article in Sex and Society, that ancient Egyptians were so inspired by the act of self-stimulation that at the festival of the god Min, who represented the pharaoh's sexual potency, men masturbated in public. I think it's around then, and I, either I was the man doing it or I really enjoyed doing it. So, wow, it was good times. Yay to the Egyptians masturbating publicly. So proud of you guys. So if we could do that, I wonder if that would like change, you know, like you're in a line at the store and you just need to get by. You're like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Then you just like pull it out and you just like everybody to be distracted by your public masturbation. And then you jump the line and you're like ahead of everybody else. I think these could be used to our advantages in different ways. And you know, just, I'm always thinking outside the box on how can utilize these things and, may stop a lot of fighting in the world too you know um i'm thinking i'm thinking that's true so thank you for the comment on that absolutely stop fighting it could create a lot of joy ecstasy in fact right how could we you know spread love not war this is one way to start it spread self-love self-stimulation so we're going to head to break in a few minutes and i still have like another 10 of these awesome things to share with you guys so I'm pretty stoked about that. I thought, wow, I've only got 15 things to say. I'm just going to be a fast show, but apparently not. I have a lot more to say about a lot of this that I even knew. And, and Keisha, you are correct. You just don't masturbate in public here if you're in Baptist territory or if you're in northern Ontario where they just look at you like you're a freak for even speaking in a way that that's understandable. So, yeah, I am stoked and stroked uh, about what's coming up next. So when we come back from break, a little more crazy talk from around the world. Many of us have created a lot of limitations around sex and what we are willing to choose. Would you be willing to explore what has already been introduced as sexual practices on this planet? 
What else is possible beyond what we have already seen, heard, or thought of? What if now is the time for a totally different sexual revolution? Taking the taboo out of all aspects of sex, sexuality, and copulation. By tuning into The Pleasure Zone radio show with body whisperer Melitza Yelenich, you'll receive tools, inspiration, and a foundation to allow yourself to receive more in your sex life and quite possibly other areas of your life as well. Listen for The Pleasure Zone with Melitza every Monday at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 7 p.m. Central Time, 6 p.m. Mountain Time, and 5 p.m. Pacific Time on A2Zen.fm. What would you say if I told you that you could change your life in only one hour and all while lying down relaxing? Thousands of people all over the world have. What am I talking about? It's called Access Consciousness The Bars. The Bars is an energetic body process that contains 32 different points on your head that when run assist you in releasing decisions about any area of your life that you have made solid and as a result cannot change. The Bars is the first class in Access Consciousness a dynamic set of tools and information designed to transform any area of your life. When you have a bar session, the worst that can happen is you feel like you had a fantastic massage. The best thing that can happen is your whole life could change. Go to accessconsciousness.com today to find a facilitator to schedule a private session or to find a bars class in your area. Are you willing to give yourself an hour to change your life? This is The Pleasure Zone with body whisperer Melitza Yelenich. To participate in the program today, please call us in the U.S. Call 815-880-8255-TALK or Canada 613-800-8736 or you can Skype us at A2Zen.fm. You can also make the choice to ask for comment by email by sending to Melitza at MelitzaYelenich.com. Now back to the program. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to The Pleasure Zone. I'm your host, Amelia Sjelanić, and tonight I am talking about sex rites and rituals from around the world. Um, if you guys are hearing noises in the background, it's because I have, you know, the family members over getting ready for the wedding, so I apologize for that. I, I did ask for quiet, but that doesn't mean anything. So they're all very excited and talking and talking. So I have a discussion in the back um, room here that says, you know, letting kids touch each other at such a young age would definitely take a lot of significance and taboo out of it early on. And what comes up for her is consent. Like anything else, are these kids being forced or pressured or are they just allowed to play and explore? So uh, from a lot of the research that I had read, it was like, uh, the girls are given huts when they're choosing to have their huts, and then they can go and have their sex play. And then for the other one that I'd read about way back in the day, the little girl was more like um, it was more like a social pressure to fit in, and so she was kind of like the way we'd be like, "Well, go to university." For her, it was like, "Well, go do sex play," and she's like, "Oh man, that's boring." And it's kind of like for us, like, "Go to school." Oh man, that's boring. That was actually a lot of their learning. Um, it was based on that. Um, so how, you know, how to like please your husband in the future was like, this was all like training, right? Just like a kid might not really like going to swim class or karate class. This is like what they do for training. So it's funny, right? Because our, what we would take as very personal, like your body is having like a sexual experience. Um, for them, it could be a violation to, to have a kid like, go and have to learn how to read, right? Like we don't really know what for them is like considered a violation that we would consider a violation. So there's there's such for me like these sort of um, societal things and looking at it from a sociological, anthropological like point of view, uh, looking at like the grander uh, picture from their communities and societies, to me is like because of, from our point of view, what we make it as um, like not acceptable or that that's a violation uh, is so not the case. So um, a lot of things that we've been training um, kids to do, you know, clean the house for, you know, some, you know, if you taught royalty how to do that a hundred years ago, it would have been considered an insult. 
Um, so, so many things that we do now uh, or have done, you know, historically, like so many of these things get changed and have become like insulting, violations, blah, blah, blah. So um, one of the questions is training. So teaching sex as a duty or responsibility, not exactly sex for pleasure receiving. Well, actually teaching it as like a duty of pleasure. Like your job is to know how to get these people's body parts to work. So for the boy, his job is to know how to get the girl's body parts to work. And for the girls, is to know how to get the boy's body parts to work. So that's their, was one of their main, um, di- like, just directives in life, I guess you could say. Like, that was, that's their um, thing where in other societies it might be to build or to hunt. And for them, it's like pleasuring each other. So, yeah, so it's kind of an interesting an interesting sort of uh, way of going about the world. My house is getting cold, so I'm getting shivery. So uh, I'm going to have to get heat on as soon as we finish this show tonight. So uh, number six. Uh, so if you hear me chattering my teeth, it's because I'm getting a little cold. Um, <laughs> is number six on the list is the Guajiro and I hope I'm pronouncing this right, or Guajiro, people of Colombia. I've been to Colombia, and I didn't meet these Guajiro people at all. Uh, I wish I did, because they say that there's a ritual ceremony, that they engage in this ritual ceremony dance in which if a young lady trips a young man while dancing, they must have sex. There is, that one is, uh, that's the rule of the game. So, there, uh, you know, there's like not a lot of choice going on, but I know a few of my friends are going to go out tripping people tonight just for fun. Not naming names, but they are in the back room doing some chat in my chat room right now. So, um, number seven, um, male sexuality and same-sex marriages were prominent for centuries in the Siwa tribe of Egypt. If men didn't act gay, they were considered outcasts. How interesting is that? Especially we're talking about probably the same era um, of time that, or possibly the same era of time where there was this public masturbation going on in Egypt. God, I love Egyptians, right? Uh, You know, if you're not sort of gay, there's something wrong with you. What I kind of like that is that there was, like, they probably didn't even call it gay. So a lot of the terminology we're using wasn't even available at that time. Like the term homosexual and heterosexual are very actually new to our language. They're less than 200 years old. They weren't things that people even like referred to. It was just that you had a friend that was, there were activities. There was like, um, there was the word homo and hetero, but they weren't really like acknowledged as um, that way. There was, it was a different way. There was sodomists. You know, so it was like if you were a male having sex with a man, you were kind of sodomist, which was a little different than the terminology we're using today. So when they say that if you didn't act gay, it was more like if you weren't willing to be a sodomist or as a man give men oral pleasures or stimulate them or, you know, have like sex acts with them, then it was very odd. So number eight is crazy little place off the coast of Ireland called Innisberg, and I think I'm pronouncing it completely wrong. So my Irish friends out there, if you know how to do any Gaelic and you can say this place, please say it correctly for me. It's I-N-I-S-B-E-A-G, two little things. It's in a tiny island. Um, And on this crazy little island in Ireland is considered to be one of the most sexually repressed societies ever. In fact, so sexually repressed that it's kind of like... I don't know if you've ever heard of, there are different, um, like, Mennonites uh, or Amish. And the chances of the Amish and Mennonite listening to this are pretty slim. The, they will um, they will actually keep their underwear on during all sexual encounters. And people consider intercourse to be hard on their health. Warning to all of my friends who enjoy sex, do not go to I-N-I-S 
B-E-A-G in Ireland. It's not going to work for you. Okay, now that I got that out of the bag and everybody's safe. Uh, everybody's trying to find this to make sure they don't accidentally get a stopover in the um, somewhere, you know, somewhere in their life. They're not going to get a stopover layover on an airplane in Innisbiag. I think somebody's trying to pronounce it for me in Innisbiag. But I'm going to put it in the... There we go. So now it's in the chat room for anybody who wants to see it. And for everybody else, you can take your underwear off unless you go to that Ireland, I, Irish Isle Island because it's crazy there. Everything that is, because that's just my point of view that that's crazy. What if they're onto something? What if they know something that we don't know? Like, what if keeping your underwear on is enjoyable? I've actually tried that on occasion, and I didn't have, like, uh, crotchless underwear. It's not very comfortable, kids. I'm just saying, like, if you're new to this whole, like, intercourse um, thing, and you're kind of like not, you know, what to do. Underwear off is a heck of a lot easier than trying to do underwear on, especially if your underwear is slightly tight and you're just trying to like get, you know, the thing over to the side enough so that you can have insertion going on and some stimulation going on. Create a little chafing on the penis. Just saying, it's not the best choice. So if you can do underwear off. That's a really great, great way to do it. And they could be concerned about giraffes, Keisha. That's true. Staying cozy and warm and keeping your underwear on. I just, I'm sure the guy has like a slit through his, somewhere through his, I don't know, boxer shorts or underwear, like they usually do. And bang, there you go. It kind of slips out. And I don't know. It's just like, wow. I have heard, you know, there are different um, religions back in the day that would do it through sheet holes um, because. It wasn't cool not to, and I can't remember what they, which religions they were. I just know that there are people in the world who are doing it through sheet holes, so I don't want to name who it was until I actually get the stats on that. So now, number nine, the Mangaya. I'm going to pronounce it Mangaya. Gaia, Mangaya. I think it's Mangaya. M-A-N-G-A-I-A, Mangaya. A tiny island in the South Pacific is home to some of the earliest and most advanced sexual education. Starting at 13, boys have sex with older women. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge to my friends who would like to go be sex educators. Starting at 13, not that I want to be with a 13-year-old, just saying I'm thinking like 25 is maybe about as young as I'd like to go. But whoever, whatever, whatever floats your boat. Starting at 13, boys have sex with older women who teach them restraint and how to last longer to please a woman. Aren't they doing a great service to society? I'm just like so proud of what they're putting out in the world and offering this amazing education to the boys. It is. It's incredibly kind. And like the women, and they, they're honoring the women's and knowing. And, and the women are like, come on, boys, you can do it. You can last longer. We're going to assist you. Come on. So, so wow. Yeah, so the next one. I know I have so many crazy things to tell you guys tonight. There is a village in Brazil called Mehinaku where men compete for sex with women by giving them gifts of fish. I'm just like, okay, relatively, I'm not a big fish eater, so I'm thinking it's not going to really work for me. But if I suppose I lived in Brazil and would like to get it on, I would say thanks for the fish, boys. And what's weird, okay, this is the funny part, is in Serbia, um, they actually say when guys go out on the night to go, like, you know, hit on girls, they're like, let's go fishing, boys. And... And I was like, what? You guys are gross because it's also like a term that they'll use for women's crotches. And I'm thinking like, guys, have are girls in Serbia just not like washing it up enough? Like what's going down? Anyway, I, I'm speaking of that because I've gone out in Serbia with, you know, my cousins who are like, oh, yeah, we're going to go fishing tonight. I'm like, you guys are weird, man. Why would you want to be picking up the girls who smell like fish? I'm just saying there's got to be a little something going on there I want to take care of. Look on Rhea, something funky. I'm not sure, but that's that's my cousins for you. Ah, so, yeah, competing with fish is something else. And so, number... 
Oh, yeah. So there was actually the tribe in Cambodia. It wasn't uh, the Krung tribe, not the K- so the Kreung tribe in Cambodia are the ones who build the love huts. So I got those two tribes mixed up. Sorry about that, kids. But divorce is illegal there. So what they do is they find their matches by playing with the boys until they find the one that they like. It's kind of like a sexual sorting hat. If you're into Harry Potter and you'd like to have your own sexual sorting hat, love hut, that's what you could do. Set one up in your front yard. Go, I'm going to test you out. going to test you out. going to test you out. Yeah, oh, cool. I'll test you out and uh, good to go. Uh, I missed my break because I only have eight minutes left and I just want to keep talking until I run out of things to talk about. So number 12, in the Middle Ages, there was a church. The church dictated that the missionary position was the only proper way to have sex. So doing it from behind was, of course, the most shameful thing to do. Woohoo! To me, I'm extremely shameful. It's my favorite from behind. Yeehaw! It's actually there's a name for it called coitus atergo. Tergo. There, I didn't know that there was uh, tergo was the term for doing it from behind. It was also really common back in the day. Um, this is not in the list of top 15, but one of the things that would actually occur for royalty, especially um, or nobility. Back in the um, day, like you were talking 14th, 15th, 3rd century and before that, would be that there would have to be proof of of uh, copulation so that there was like, so would actually the married couple, because I'm getting married, I was kind of laughing about this, but uh, the married couple would have to prove that they had sex. So by proving it, at first they started to realize that people were faking it. Um, and could bring in cloths that had blood on them, and they could prove that they were having Ziva bye-bye. Bye, Ziva. Sorry, I'm getting totally interrupted by my daughter tonight, which is, like, crazy. So the um, so they would come in, um, and a lot of times they would fake having had, like, been a virgin. So they would fake blood on sheets or whatever. Um, if you want more on that, you can watch anything on any of the queens of England, like Elizabeth. Watch the movie Elizabeth. She, I think, faked uh, that she was a virgin queen for many years. And so they would watch. Yeah, everybody would watch you to ensure that you actually did the deed. And they would have proof. Yeah, the sheet check. How does it get any better than that? So, and it's like you're, it's supposed to be your first time doing this and you've got an audience, you know. Can you imagine, like, people are standing around, having their drinks, smoking their cigars, uh, like you might not be nervous enough or like the guy might not have enough uh, performance anxiety as it is. Holy list. And like, uh, that, that when I actually heard that sent me into such a weird place. So that one, I know I have a lot of points of view on and I know I got a lot of energy to clear on that, whether I was one who like actually created that freaking law or whether I had that law enforced on me multitudes of times, whatever it is about that law, about having the, the audience forced upon you if i'm choosing an audience that's different but if i'm having an audience forced upon me not so cool about that it is kind of like totally like early porn um that's that was my first point of view too keisha i was like was this how they got away with early porn and they would have like you know more uh, orgiastic stuff too but that's a whole other day and story so that's the middle ages for you so next on the list is that Arewakoma of Brazil, they play it real simple and use the same word for eating and sex, since both involve taking something into your body. Ain't that kind of simple and easy? So whatever that word is, we could use it, find out. Um, haven't I didn't actually discover what that word was. I just did some uh, research the other day on this. So, And now here's another one. Some tribes of the Himalayas practice polyandry, so where brothers all share one sex partner. So it works well for them because then they don't have to lose their farmland. Um, and it also, the land doesn't become overpopulated with children. Uh, that is actually like common in a lot of tribes where they'll share a wife uh, just so that they don't have to have multiple children. And also because there's like often like a lack of food 
um, the terrain isn't very friendly. So there's like a lot of conditions that play into that, where they'll have one wife, um, two multiple brothers. And I know I've been in those lands in many lifetimes too. Kind of dug that one. That was fun. Good times. Uh, even if I was one of the brothers. Yeah. So the other one is the Marquesas Island. And it was just considered just fine to witness your parents doing the deed. I had to end on that one because it's just like, what? I know I've heard too much in my life from my parents doing whatever. And like now I've got my family over and... I'm so glad I don't hear my parents doing the deed because they got divorced many, many years ago. and That would just be awkward and strange. One of the other ones that I did find that was peculiar and interesting, if you've ever been to Haiti, and if you've never been to Haiti, it's, uh, you know, an, uh, it's on the same island as the Dominican Republic, but if you cross over the border from Dominican into Haiti, you get into voodoo villages. Um, so... You know, that's kind of like the birthplace of, well, it's not the total birthplace of voodoo because that was more in Africa, but this is like a huge place where voodoo became like massively um, famous. So if you travel there, there is a famous waterfall called the Soto. And during the month of July, you can witness um, a quite a risque ritual where voodoo practitioners make um, the journey to worship the goddess of love. Well, um, this is not just your average, you know, we're going to go worship the goddess and light some candles. No, 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 no. It's a bunch of buck naked people twisting and wriggling around in mud mixed with the blood of sacrificed animals with cow and goat heads thrown into the mix. I know all of you are buying your next ticket to Haiti for July so you can witness this event and participate because you guys be my kind of people and want that kind of crazy stuff. I get that. Oh, so... Um, my very, very, one of my very, very last ones, because um, I keep on realizing that I found way more information than I thought. And I love this one because it is so, it's such a contradiction to what we, what we hear in the media. Um, so what we hear in the media about Muslims um, is that there's a lot of uh, stuff that says, you know, women are submissive. Uh, there's this, there's that. Um, I'm personally not Muslim, so I can't speak from that. But I did find this interesting um, information that modern Iranian culture allows you to have a temporary marriage if you pay for it. So, for instance, Muslim couples um, usually, they, according to their belief system, and, and I don't think I know any of the Muslims I know probably don't follow this rule, that the deal is that they're only supposed to do it in missionary. Well, let's just say that's probably unlikely because any other position is degrading. Um, so and in all of all countries in Iran, a young couple would like to, who would like to have sex before they're married can request a temporary marriage, and they're allowed to pay for a short ceremony with a written contract dictating the amount of time they'd like to be married. Once this is done, they can have all the sex they like like bunnies without contradicting any Islamic law so she doesn't get killed for it. How's it getting any better than that? As I got like 30 seconds left, and I just want to say thanks for listening to my crazy wacky show tonight. I'm so grateful to have all of you on this. And um, if you would like to join me on any of the upcoming uh, telecalls I'm promoting or the ones that I'm actually doing like my best open your psychic self call starting in january or joining my friends for choosing big starting january 14th let me know i'm so freaking thrilled to like invite all of you into my life have a great week thank you for choosing to listen to the pleasure zone melissa yelenich will return next monday at 8 p.m eastern time 7 p.m central 6 p.m mountain and 5 p.m pacific on a2zen.fm We hope you'll join us. Until then, have the best week of your life by choosing to be turned on and tuned in to your body.